Hi everyone, I'm Laura Waters. I'm an HIV and sexual health doctor from Central London and I'm going to be talking about the challenges in HIV care in the COVID-19 era. These are my disclosures. Now I'm going to cover the impact that COVID-19 has had on services and monitoring, touch on some of the guidance we produced at the British HIV Association, talk about some patient perspectives and then finish on the future. So firstly, the impact of COVID-19 on services. Now the initial impact will have varied a lot from one region, one country, even one clinic to another, but broadly speaking, there were the effects on staff and patients. Now for staff, many were redeployed at very short notice to help manage COVID-19 cases. Others may have been experiencing sickness or the need to isolate or have caring duties of their own. For patients, they're of course subject to lockdown measures which limited access to services and the fear of COVID-19 exposure meant many didn't want to come to clinic. Now one of the key things that we must do when we're talking to patients about COVID and when we're planning services is to make sure we are abreast of the latest evidence and one of the main drivers of anxiety and concern is whether or not people with HIV are at greater risk of COVID or COVID complications. Now the first thing is based on the latest summary of the evidence is people with HIV do not appear to be at a higher risk of developing COVID or acquiring coronavirus. Although of course we must consider the confounders of distancing and shielding and certainly locally our experience was many people with well controlled HIV were choosing to isolate where they could so there may have been a lower risk of exposure. Secondly, there is some evidence to suggest people with HIV may be at a higher risk of death, but no study has fully addressed the potential confounders. And one major one that is often not or very poorly adjusted for is occupation. Again, locally, our experience was people with HIV seem to often work in frontline roles, be that in the service industry, the healthcare industry, or in transport. And where risks have been demonstrated and where HIV has been suggested to be associated with a higher risk of COVID-19 mortality, this has not been as great as some other well-established risks such as haematologic malignancy. And finally, where any risk has been demonstrated, it's been most marked in people who have other risk factors such as other comorbidities. So what did we do locally, and this summarises I know many clinics experience, is we moved to virtual consultations. Now for us it actually meant primarily telephone, although we did have some access to online platforms, we tended to use Zoom, Attend Anywhere is an NHS approved system that many clinics moved to. We also created something called the back phone. This is very much a local development because we know how frustrating it can be to try and get through to somebody. So we actually bought a very cheap mobile phone and advertised that mobile phone number on our clinic website so that people could call a doctor directly. And that's still proving valuable now. The other thing we did was update our website, not only with links to the national guidance, but also with links to specific advice about our own clinical services. What else did we do? Well, the other major change was monitoring, essentially for most people where it was considered safe, which was most people, is we deferred a blood monitoring visit, meaning that we're now in a, at a time where most people have had at least 12 months between their usual monitoring, which in line with many other countries was six monthly for us. The other thing we did was make sure we preserved medication supplies. Now, unlike some countries, we routinely prescribe six months of medication. So we did give longer prescriptions for people who were not on six monthly prescribing. We also expanded postal options. We already used some home care delivery schemes, but we expanded that to be able to post people's medication out to save them a visit to the clinic. And we also avoided undertaking anything but urgent therapy switches during this time. And all of this was supported by our national guidance. This is just one example from the British HIV Association. We also did statements on critical care and we did a statement with EACS and the German, Polish and Spanish HIV societies, which is updated regularly. This national one was around antiretroviral therapy, but also the kind of minimum standards for care during the pandemic that services could use to base their plans upon. 
Now, at the moment, we're dealing with a second wave here in the UK. So we produce some advice for the second wave. And we really are saying that where people have missed one set of monitoring bloods and urine tests, we really need to be trying to get them back. So there's not a longer than 12 month gap. But where that's not possible, of course, we must assess that case by case. And for the majority, that means continuing antiretroviral therapy. Maintaining capacity for urgent cases, whether that's antenatal care, uh, HIV complications, people with mental health difficulties, we must maintain some capacity to support them. And we try to coordinate with other teams as much as possible, so other community care teams and primary care. The other thing is a reminder about the advice for people with HIV to have their influenza and pneumococcal vaccines, which is particularly important at the moment. Now, what are some of the risks in terms of the service changes we've undertaken? Now, one is related to the monitoring and of course the fact we could be missing toxicity issues such as renal and hepatic toxicity. We could be missing virologic failure. And is there a risk that we'll see more resistance emergence as it takes longer to detect failure where it has occurred? The other risk is access. Now, again, this is UK data, but even as recently as last year, only 79% of UK adults owned a smartphone and the idea that everybody's got easy access to the internet on their mobile phones is not necessarily correct. Now, if you look at the 16 to 24 age group in the UK, they all have smartphones. However, if we move up to 55 to 64 year olds, which of course account for an increasing proportion of people with HIV, 27% of them do not have access to the internet via a mobile phone. And for people aged 65 or older, that goes up to 60%. So we must ensure that we're not disenfranchising people who don't have easy access to online services. The other risk is the perception that services are shut and that people won't access services when they need help with physical or mental health issues. Then there are the risks of missed opportunities. Missed opportunities to detect physical and mental health conditions. Missed opportunities to detect other sexually transmitted infections, that is gonorrhea. And then the missed opportunities to detect issues such as domestic abuse or intimate partner violence. And by not seeing people face to face and offering them the privacy to discuss these issues, are we gonna miss detecting them? Next, patient perspectives, which are absolutely crucial. I wanted to share just some very brief findings from a UK community survey. This is a network of HIV community organizations in the UK. And they shared a survey online via social media and community groups and got 305 responses, although acknowledged these were not fully representative in terms of region, gender and risk group. But these are some of the key concerns. 13% of people reported appointments being canceled with no alternative being arranged. Others reported canceled tests. 10% were concerned they had no confidential setting at home for virtual appointments. So the idea that everybody can shift to a phone call or a video consultation at home is not realistic. And one in 20 didn't have enough data or digital device access to use remote services. And all of these must be considered when planning the future. Because of course the change we undertook was very rapid and very unplanned. And usually if we're undertaking major service change, we'd engage our service users. And although many people are describing that everything's fine and nothing major has gone wrong, we must acknowledge that what's acceptable to patients and to staff in an emergency scenario may not be acceptable for long term care. So what we've done now with our almost exclusively virtual consultations and hands off monitoring, that shouldn't necessarily become the new normal until the outcomes have been analysed in collaboration with people living with HIV to ensure that that's satisfactory. Which brings me to the future, and there are many questions for the future. How do we maintain access but minimise contact? How is this going to fit with the era of injectable therapy? Clinical trial design, the impact of COVID on HIV clinical trials has been well described, and things like needing written consent, for example, really do need to be addressed. How do we ensure people aren't left behind as we rely increasingly on technology? And how do we capture the experience for everybody? Because an online survey will not be accessed by all. 
And we must learn from the research that exists. This is a paper from the UK looking at the use of virtual consultations in diabetes and cancer services. And the clear thing is there are actually some advantages. Patients tended to do more of the talking in virtual consultations, but a key point is the virtual consultations worked best when the clinician and patient already knew and trusted each other. So a lot of the virtual consultations we've been undertaking have been, have been with patients that we've already formed face-to-face -face relationships with. And how you develop that relationship if most care is delivered virtually is a challenge we must address. And of course, we mustn't forget the old lessons, the power of nonverbal communication, eye contact, touch, the power of silence and waiting for someone to speak, which can be very challenging on the phone, whereas if you're sat with somebody, you can look at their nonverbal communication and make more sensitive judgments. And the whole body, how someone is dressed and how they appear. And the power of wait here a moment when you're concerned about somebody and you just pop out of your clinic room to speak to somebody else, to get a peer support worker, to speak to your psychology or health advisor team. And also the gut feeling. I think many of us just have that sense of when things aren't right and whether we can apply that sense when we're talking to somebody on the telephone is clearly an important question. But let's finish on a positive and what might be better. So actually virtual consultations for many people will be more convenient and less intrusive into their day-to-day -day lives actually getting some evidence about how much monitoring we need to do. And I expect for at least a subset of patients, annual monitoring will prove to be ample. Making sure we are prescribing efficiently and increasing options, if that means better options for delivery of medication, that's a good thing. Making sure people are up to date with their vaccines, such as influenza and pneumococcal. And if COVID-19 is a lever for that, that may be a benefit. And finally, actually, because we were aware that during COVID-19, domestic abuse was an increasingly reported issue, our documented questioning of that risk is much, much better. So certainly within our service, asking about domestic abuse is something we are doing better than we did before. And really, COVID-19 is giving us a clean slate, a clean slate to redesign our services in the safest and most efficient way. But we must remember the community of people living with HIV should be at the heart of any service redesign. I'll finish there by thanking you for your kind attention.